Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee. We have a quorum. We have our uh, regional partners present. Uh, welcome. It's Tuesday, March 15th, and uh, I want to call this meeting to order at uh, 8.42. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, and uh, thank you for hanging in with us. Uh, item number two is public comment, and I'm wondering, Cam, if uh, through all that, do we have folks who have asked to address the uh, RTC? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a, I'll give it a moment. I currently do not see any hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. If there are people who do want to offer public comment, uh, please uh, raise your hand during the meeting on, and we'll try to circle back for you because uh, we do value uh, public comment. Item three is the meeting summary of last month's meeting and um, assuming that folks have had a chance to review it uh, without any uh, objections, we'll uh, consider them accepted and move on. Item four, uh, transit super call project funding for July 22 through June 23. And I think Matt Helfant is going to present on that. Is Matt here? Oh, there he is. Uh, I don't hear you. Cannot hear you. Matt, I have had this problem on Zoom occasionally. I've had to uh, leave the meeting and then come back in. I don't know if that will, will help. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Let's Whatever you did, send out a memo because we could all use that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. It's been some morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now so I can get the presentation loaded. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Matthew Helfant, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, Dr. Cog had a, has a, had its first ever combined call for projects with three different uh, transportation funding sources. Uh, the uh, Human Service Transportation Tip set aside the um, the uh, FDA 5310 for the Denver Aurora Urbanized Area and um, Older Americans Act funding from the Area Agency on Aging. These projects will be implemented uh, between uh, July 1st of this year and June 30th of 2023. So we received uh, 14 uh, uh, proposals from 15 organizations requesting uh, more than, than, than what was available. Uh, so there's definitely need out there and um, TAC and RTC only approved the, uh, the HST and 5310. Um, and uh, and uh, the, uh, the Older Americans Act funding is approved by uh, the, um, the uh, Area Agency on Aging. Uh, just want to uh, just say that up front. Okay, so uh, th these are all in your packet. These are, uh, we convened an, in, um, an independent a committee to review all of the applications. And these are the recommendations uh, from the committee. They're in your packet with more detail. And so the proposed motion, uh, before I get to the proposed motion, I just wanna add a couple notes. Um, the VIA funds for uh, facilities um, may be shifted to uh, operations and maintenance and or mobility management uh, it, because they're dependent on other funding sources uh, for that big project. And so uh, if they're unable to get the other grant funding, then uh, they're able to shift those funds they need to. And um, all, all awards are subject to FTA review uh, for eligibility. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, your audio was a little spotty. It was uh, fading a little bit for me. I don't know if it was true for everybody else, but I did hear uh, almost everything. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, members? 
please. I don't see any hands. Matt, let me uh, ask you, in the narrative, it, uh, if you could go down to the list, uh, or I'm sorry, go up a slide to the list of recommended funding totaling 6.9 million. In the narrative, I thought I read that there was 6.6 .6 million available. Uh, what, am, what did I miss here? I'm trying to think. Um, is, is Travis on the line? He was also, he, he might be able to answer that question. Yeah, I'm trying to I think can. of what that project might be <clears throat> on next. Yeah, yeah, uh, Matthew, I can answer that. The The reason it's different um, is because we have a couple carryover projects from prior uh, years. Yes. Um, so there's okay. 6.6 .6 million in new money. It's about the new money. 300,000 right. 300, in um, old money, basically. Excellent. Thank you so much. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to entertain a motion from any member to uh, uh, on the uh, proposed action. So moved, Kate Williams. It was Kate Williams. Uh, Director Levy, second. Uh, second. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there any comment or discussion? If not, could we do this by voice vote? All those in favor of recommending uh, to uh, the board the HST and FTA 5310 projects for the next year. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Hey, this is Jessica Perko with the Regional Air Quality Council. I'll be abstaining. I'm listening in for Mike Silverstein today, so I don't really have the approval to vote. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Cam, can we make a note of that abstention in the meeting notes? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, excellent. All right, let us move on to item, uh, I gotta scroll back up here. Uh, item five, unallocated fiscal year 22 tip, waitlist project funding recommendations. And Josh was filling in for Todd Cottrell, correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so let me pull up the memo for you. Um, so as per the adopted TIP policy, when um, the TIP call for projects was held, uh, some projects which were not able to be funded at that time were added to a waiting list that uh, is a list of projects that can be funded should additional funding become available. Um, so last year, staff did become aware that there were two uh, additional funding sources that had become available. The first is the State uh, Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Op Options Fund, uh, which was uh, sort of restructured and extended through Senate Bill 260. Uh, the second was the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, which extended uh, and renewed the federal funding sources, which we allocate through the TIP. Um, so we did proceed through the waitlist process. Uh, staff divided the funding 20% to the regional share and then 80% to the sub-regional share, which was then further proportionally targeted to each of our sub-regions. And staff contacted the individual sponsors that were listed on the wait list in rank order. So the uh, first uh, listing was contacted first. Uh, should they accept funds, uh, those funds were removed from available funds and then we worked down the list in order. Um, Attachment two in your packet contains the wait list as it was um, at the beginning of this process. And attachment three lists the recommended list of projects which will be funded. Um, some of these are additional scope or additional phases on projects that are already included in the TIP. And some of these are brand new projects uh, recommended to be added to the TIP. Um, so with that, I do have a proposed motion available in your packet and on your screen, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Any questions from members? I don't see any. I hope no one's trying to ask a question and they, they can't unmute. Uh, this is going unbelievably uh, smoothly after the, the halting start. So let me uh, throw a, a wrench into the works, uh, Josh, and ask uh, $87 million in available funding, but of course there are some filters to this first call, correct? Uh, because I noticed that with the $87 million available, we are only allocating a small portion of that. And in fact, none of the subregions is, uh, uh, is being uh, recommended for uh, the full amount for which are eligible. So maybe uh, if you could explain to us why that is. 
Sure. And I know um, a little bit, I know a little bit of the answer, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands because it's just, you know, with all, with $87 million there, and we're only programming X uh, amount uh, that uh, begs to be explained. Absolutely. So this is the uh, final year of the original tip. Uh, the when when projects were selected uh, the last time that was for the 2020 to 2023 tip. Um, so many of the projects on the existing waitlist may have moved forward with local funds, and so we're not looking to um, accept funds at this time from the waitlist. Another issue was that uh, there was limited eligibility for some of the funding types, for instance, the right. state MMOF funds, those can only right. be targeted towards projects which increase uh, multimodal travel or uh, assist with air quality. Um, so that may have limited uh, the amount of funds that some of the projects were able to uh, accept. Um, so any funds that were left on the table as part of this process and that were not accepted by projects on the waitlist, those will be rolled over into the call for projects that are currently um, underway for the new 20, well, to amend projects into the current 2022 to 2025 uh, tip and then following that to uh, create the new 24 to 27 tip. Thank you, Josh. And that was gonna be my next question. Uh, Mr. Papsdorf, did you have something to add to this? I noticed you turned on your video. Excellent. All right, thank you. Josh did great. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, members have questions on this item? If not, I would like to ask, would anyone like to propose the motion to recommend this to the board? Uh, Director Shaw. I move to recommend the board programming of an unanticipated available fiscal year 2022 funding uh, to waitlist projects and administratively modify the fiscal year 22 to 25 tip. Thank you, Director Shaw. Uh, who would like to second this? Don't all rush. Director Levy. I will second this. Thank you so much. Uh, any further comments or discussion on this? Seeing none, let me call for a vote. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Um, I'll be abstaining. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Cam, could you please uh, make a note of that one also? Uh, so yeah. this will then, this will, thank you. This will move on to the board tomorrow and we move on to item six on the agenda, which again, it takes me a while to scroll up again on my other screen. Item six is, oh, Matt, you're up again. Reimagine yep. RTD update. And I see uh, Mr. Soroy has also uh, started his video. So are we gonna, gonna have a tag team here or? I'm just, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to introduce it really quickly and then I'm going to pass it on to Bill Soroy. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, so good morning again. Uh, Imagine RTD is an effort by RTD to evaluate and forecast the changing transportation needs of our region. And RTD wants to understand what's important to customers, stakeholders, and the public. And when complete, our RTD intends that this process will identify comprehensive forward thinking strategies to better connect people to the places they want to go and within uh, with the available resources. Um, a key component of this project is um, developing a system op optimization plan or SOP and RTD released a draft mm -hmm. SOP for public review in early January. The SOP includes recommendations for service redesign and serves as a route by route guide for service development between late 2022 this year and 2027. Public comments on the SOP were due by March 9th. I believe the, uh, the board actually uh, submitted some public comments and uh, Bill Soroy from RTD is here to provide an update and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, uh, take it away. Are you, you have a presentation to show us? Yeah, and I just want to make sure I'm, you can hear me on my audio. Okay, great. Okay. I will try to share my screen, but given everything that's gone on this morning, I may put Matt on standby. So we'll see how this works here. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so, okay, so you, you can see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. 
So um, I'm not seeing it. So let's see if I can. Uh, well, I'm going to go from this. Can you guys tell? So this is good. So I just want to make sure I'm on the first slide because I am not seeing my slides on my screen. Thank you. We are on the title slide. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much. And again, apologize for hopefully be, this will run fairly smoothly. Uh, I'm here to talk about Reimagine RTD. Uh, like Matthew said, um, we've kind of hit a milestone. We have the draft SOP that we released earlier this year, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and let me go to that. Uh, we also have um, uh, uh, extensive public engagement, which I'll go over some of the comments that we received. And I'll talk very briefly about the mobility plan for the future, which is our longer term um, plan. Uh, moving on to um, the overview, again, two elements to this plan, uh, the system optimization plan, which is really our shorter term plan focused on how do we um, maximize and kind of make our current service more efficient. Um, you know, we, like many agencies, have been going through some trying times even before the pandemic, and we wanted to look at ways that we can make our system more efficient. And, and that will be focused on between now and 2027. Uh, the mobility plan for the future, which is our longer term um, plan, that really is looking kind of more aspirationally at what we can do in the future and taking into consideration some you know, major issues that we're dealing with right now, including workforce, technology, other things that really are gonna drive how we're gonna evolve as an agency. Okay, moving to the next slide here. So what is the SOP? So like I said, you know, our focus um, with this, we started this over two and a half years ago. It's hard to believe that we've been at it that long, but with the pandemic, it's kind of stretched our time frame a little bit. Um, but you know, even before the pandemic, we were experiencing, as many agencies around the country were, a declining ridership. We undertook the SOP to say, how can we hopefully reverse that trend and increase ridership, improve efficiency, and live within our budget? Because we were having challenges even before the pandemic, budget-wise, with putting out the service that we could in terms of being, you know, um, a sustainable level of service. So we were, we wanted to address that. Also, now with the pandemic, we have to address, you know, come some new challenges with what's happening with our travel demand and how does that affect how we look at service. We also want to obviously remain competitive. Um, you know, it's a changing environment. And we want to make sure that we are, um, you know, a, a, an option, a, a, a primary option for people to take, you know, to, to where they want to go. And then lastly, um, improving that service quality, which is an issue I think that we've had in the past and that we were trying to really focus on, especially given some of our challenges on our workforce side. So um, let's talk a little bit about our guiding principles. So this, these principles were adopted by our board. I believe, I'm trying to think right now, it's hard to believe this kind of time frame in my mind, but early last year. Um, and you know, the focus was this is what are these, what are these principles that we should kind of live by as we, um, you know, produce products and deliverables for the system optimization plan, as well as the mobility plan for the future, which is first one being mobility. You know, what do we want to focus on? Reliability was probably something we heard most um, loudly during this process, um, you know, making sure that people can count on us, you know, whether that be, you know, being on time, being cleanly, being safe. Um, you know, equity is another huge one on it for us in terms of, and this has really become evident during the pandemic, um, as we becoming um, accessible and re remain kind of a primary option for those people who rely on us the most. And during the pandemic, we've had to do that. Um, you know, we've had certainly seen a, a, a change kind of in our ridership and those people that need the transit obviously have been stayed with us and we want to, we want to make sure that we stay with them. Um, financial, living within our means, um, you know, this is something that I think it's a challenge for us right now. We have gotten some, you know, one-time funding through the, through the feds, through the COVID relief dollars, but those, we can't count on those funds. So how do we look beyond that and making sure that we have a sustainable um, plan? Uh, partnerships, partnerships are going to be key to us, um, working with jurisdictions, working with others to make sure that we can look to provide services maybe that you know we can partner on over that we can rely on others to provide on because we can't do everything maybe that we once could just because of our situation and workforce which is probably our primary one i know several board members are on this call as with as well as um 
GM and CEO Johnson, we could talk, I'm sure, hours about kind of our current situation. And, and we hope, I think this week, might even be able to have some good news with our CBA, hopefully will be approved. Um, and then lastly, but not least, sustainability, making sure that we um, have a plan that is certainly sustainable, that, that you know, really looks to um, optimize the delivery for our customers and really you know, looks to kind of make sure that we're being good for the environment. So with that, um, we do have some challenges, um, and, you know, and one of the challenges that we have as a district, and this is this, this isn't new to anybody. Um, you know, we have one of the largest um, service areas in the country for a transit agency. You know, we have one transit agency serving serving almost 24 square miles. You compare that to you know many other regions who have met not just one transit agency but multiple transit agencies covering you know maybe this kind of area. So it, it is a challenge for us. We have to look at how can we allocate our service effectively and fairly across the district. And so, you know, that is a challenge for us. And, you know, with limited resources, we have to balance that, the coverage piece, you know, in terms of making sure that all parts of the district have service with that frequency, you know, making sure the parts that have more ridership have that coverage or that frequency, or that, excuse me, that frequency to make sure that people are getting the service they need to get where they want to go. So the other one, and which I alluded to, and this really slide really highlights it, is, is our workforce challenge. Um, many of you probably have heard about this, and we're not certainly the only industry that's feeling this. Yeah. But um, you, you, you know, I know that Councilman Flynn kind of acknowledges that. But I mean, the trucking industry. I mean, CDOT with you know their kind of drivers. I mean, it, it is a national. Um, and cross industries. Um, but you know, the key stat on this slide is if you look at that last row, to accomplish what we wanna accomplish with the system optimization plan, increasing service from where we're at today, we need potentially in the order of 250 to 400 new operators. Um, that is a huge challenge for us. And that is gonna be kind of something that we're gonna be very focused on. And like I said, we hope we will get some good news this week with approval of our CBA. So with our drivers and get them you know, and operators and, and other support staff can get, you know, um, that out of the way and hopefully more incentive to come and, and be part of RTD. So with that, um, you know, with the SOP, some of the things that we really strive to do is really simplify our system, making sure that we have well-defined routes, um, making sure it's consistent, you know, in terms of that there is consistent service spans so people can easily understand it, eliminate those irregular trip patterns, and reliability, like I said, which is probably one of the, the biggest things that we heard throughout this process, which is how do we make our things right? One of the ways that we can do that is eliminating long routes, and you'll see in some of the recommendations for the system optimization plan, we broke up some very long um, routes that you know run across the region into a couple of different ways to make it more efficient and, and more reliable so we didn't have those um, irregularities in the schedule. So one of the other things that we did um, is we looked to kind of change the way we look at service and really do it at a, on a market base. So we created uh, four service categories, the four C's, um, core, connect, commute, and community. And starting at the top, um, those, core, those core routes, which are shown here in blue, are those ones that you know have a longer span of service, 18 hours or more, um, 15 minutes or better service most of the time. Um, so those are you know are really kind of core routes that serve kind of our mid our core level riders. And then the connect routes. Those are the, those are those local routes that connect to the core system, but really create that fabric that makes the system work. Um, and those make up about 40% of the service hours. And then the commute. Those are the ones that you know, we have to rely on some of it, particularly in the, you know, the rush hour portions of the day to make sure that we have that supplemental service to help with our, the commuting trips that, you know, particularly in and out of downtown or to other major activity centers like DAA. Um, and then lastly, but not least is the community routes. Those are the ones that are focused <laughs> in on the community and, you know, some, some ones that you may look at that, one of the, one of the ones that may not be evident, but 16th Street Mall, that is a community route. That really is focused on downtown, trying to circulate people from one end to the other. You know, we have several other community routes within, you know, the, the region, but you know, that's just an example of one that we have as well. So um, 
you know, and in terms of the draft SOP, how did how how will it improve service? Again, one of the things, like I said, we wanted to make sure that we improve, and this is compared to where we were last September. Um, having an increase in district wide access to 15 minute or better service. So we have a fairly sizable increase. Um, we also, again, on the equity side, focusing in on creating that quality service for those people who rely on transit, trying to have a 50% increase in access to 15 minute better service to those equity populations. Also a 20 minute increase in midday service. That's another thing that we heard consistently, particularly from those who rely on transit, they wanted more service during the middle of the day Again, because their travel patterns aren't necessarily oriented towards the you know rush hours at the beginning and the end of the day, so they wanted more service. So we looked to that, and I think this is a this is a pattern that we've seen with you know the way that the travel um, demand um, regionally has changed. Is that you know we used to have these huge peaks in the morning and the evening, and those now have flattened out. So we have much more kind of um, more level patterns throughout the day. So having more service during the middle of the day is important. And again, lastly, um, you know, the SOP really does try to balance that, that, that those frequent services in those high density areas with connecting to the outer suburbs. Because again, that, that is a challenge for us, like I said, because we have such a large district. And again, with the SOP, we tried to make sure that we, can, we have that balance as much as we can. So the implementation, so um, like uh, Matthew said, um, we, uh, our comment period ended last week. Um, we, we are, in the middle of reviewing and looking at those comments, um, and I'll get to the next slide about the comments in a second, but um, we will identify, you know, what what comments we can accept and what comments we can't, um, and we will develop a revised SOP, and we will have kind of that um, conversation with our board. Um, we're going to try to, like I said, we're going to try as many as we can. I think the challenge that we have is, you know, that we didn't. There's not a lot of slack in this plan, meaning that we kept a lot of budget saying we can add a bunch of new service, which is obviously where everybody, everybody's at. Because I think, I think if one thing came through loud and clear on the SOP is people want more service. And I think, you know, we are gonna try to do what we can in terms of accommodating some of those requests. Um, but we have challenges, like I've said, in terms of workforce and, you know, and then phasing through this through 2027. Um, so again, it is a five year plan for how we wanna kind of lay out service. So. Public outreach, like I said, so we, we extended that um, public engagement through um, last week, through, through March 9th. Um, we did some extensive um, outreach. Uh, we met with, uh, I think we had 30 plus meetings with individuals between December and uh, last week. Uh, we had numerous um, uh, different kinds of meetings, multicultural meetings, public meetings, um, social media, you know, out there, we were out on the, um, blogosphere a lot. Um, and we also did some additional stuff kind of in February when we did extend, we did put uh, collateral on buses. Uh, we did conduct um, additional multicultural outreach and had a Spanish um, only public meeting um, and some additional um, service sector meetings that we had in terms of meeting with different areas of the region. So in the end, and this slide is, is not updated because we just ended last week, but we actually have 1,600, over 1,600 comments um, that we've received through March 9th. Um, so we are frantically looking at those and we're gonna respond to every one. So every, every comment we are gonna respond to. And so when we go to the board that we will have a very comprehensive response document in terms of how we're gonna address the comments that we did receive. Um, I could say 80% of those comments um, were for new service um, or add, you know, adding, adding stuff. And so that, that is a challenge and it's, you know, we're gonna have to try to uh, deal with it. And we are making, you know, I think we had, we've had the come before that, you know, this is just a static plan and you're not gonna make any changes. We are making changes. Um, I think we are responding to some of the comments that we leave around, around changing, um, you know, specific routes or specific adding stuff back. And we're looking at those very um, closely in terms of what we can do and, and within kind of the the budget and the framework that we have. Um, so um, the mobility plan for the future, let me just really touch really briefly on that um, and then I'll open it up for questions. So, you know, our long-term plan, again, guided by our, the, the principles that I went over earlier in the presentation, you know, we're gonna be looking, we are looking at, at several things. Some of the bigger things I think that might interest this group, but we are looking at our 
you know, fleet electrification um, or zero emission bus plan? How could we, you know, move towards that? What are our, what are our challenges and how, how could that be phased in? Um, you know, some of our maintenance facilities, we have some challenges with that. Workforce. Um, and, you know, one of the other things that we're going to do fiscally and financially, we're going to look at what we can do in the long term um, in terms of looking at things like our TABOR limitations, what's our needs-based plan, so what things we can aspire to try to do, um, you know, in the next 30 years to make sure that we're the best transit agency that we can be for the region. So with that, um, I'm going to end this presentation and then um, I'll open it up for any questions that people may have. Also on the line, I just want to re uh, recognize that Julie Skeen is also available, who's part of our uh, consultant team on the project as well, so. Thank you, I did see um, Julie in the audience. Uh, before I go to uh, RTD Director Williams and uh, Director Levy who've raised their hands, I'd like to ask, uh, if uh, CEO and General Manager Deborah Johnson would like to uh, make a few comments before we go to questions on this process. Uh, would you like to? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sure. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity and I wanna commend Bill Soroy and the entire team for their efforts in recognizing we heard uh, viable feedback from the community. We extended the period and we do wanna work in earnest to incorporate in as many of those comments as possible, recognizing our ultimate goal here is to make lives better through connections. So want you all to know that we're leaning into this moment and trying to balance all needs for all people within the region. So with that, I will yield the floor back to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to facilitate questions. So thank you very kindly. Uh, thank you, GM Johnson. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, before I go to Director Williams, I want to mention that uh, on the Denver City Council, Last night, uh, we adopted a proclamation, issued a proclamation uh, thanking RTD operators and drivers uh, for National, Bus, uh, National uh, Transit Operator Appreciation Week. And uh, specifically this Friday, we asked people to thank their drivers and operators. I had the opportunity to mention a particular driver on the Route 21 uh, when I was on one day coming back from a DU presentation who uh, it was right after Valentine's Day, he had taped pictures of him and his wife to the bar by the fare box at, from a Valentine's Day dinner they had gone to. He talked on the PA, he announced every stop. He didn't use the automated, he announced personally every stop. He talked about the attractions or the, uh, the stores or the uh, destinations that were at every stop along Evans along the way. Uh, he talked about the, uh, some RTD events coming up but more particularly, and I, I get a little emotional about this, he talked about how much he loved his wife and how much he loved, and how much he loved his job. And uh, these folks served this region through some really incredibly perilous times the last two years. So I just want to express my appreciation, uh, uh, CEO Johnson, and to the board members who are here uh, from RTD for the job that the frontline workers have done to carry uh, those of us who uh, had to use transit, like my son, who is a who is a light rail rider every day to his job, and uh, and allowed those of us who had the luxury of have, working from home, as you can see, uh, uh, during the pandemic, but they had to go out on the front line. So thank you very much, uh, Director Williams. Go ahead. I'm sorry to hold you up. No, you you're not holding me up at all, ever, Kevin. Um, I wanted to thank the Denver City Council. For, for recognizing um, that attitude that we all need to have more of and that we have all been working toward. Obviously, I don't have to thank Bill and Julie again because they know um, that they just did the most outstanding work. And Deborah Johnson, of course, who took the words right out of my mouth, which you're probably all grateful for. So thanks to city council for, uh, for their work in this area as well. Thank you. Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I'm really glad that you took a minute, um, Chair Flynn, to mention that driver. I did not know it was National Transit Operator Week, um, but that that's really nice, and I think we we all need to do more of that. I, I just I, I'm just going to state the obvious, just because, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, the general manager Johnson said, um, you know, that we're trying to be all things to all people or, or something to that effect. And, you know, RTD really is being asked to do that. Um, it's, 
being asked to provide service throughout this massive region. Um, I participated on behalf of uh, Boulder County in putting together comments on the SOP and um, you know, true to everybody else's comments, we wanted more uh, for us. And that's what everybody wants. And uh, you know, and I see these huge gaps between the riders that you need to provide those services. And I'm sorry, not the riders, but the drivers and the drivers that you have. Um, I don't know how you bridge that gap. And I think we really need to be looking at this in a different way. I don't know what that way is, but um, you know, we have people, this is a, if you can look at it as a mobility issue for people, but also as, as we on the board of Dr. Cog went through that really exhaustive process of looking at the, the uh, greenhouse gas rulemaking and the critical role that transit is supposed to play in helping us achieve our goals for greenhouse gas reductions. You know, we're, we have so much riding on the success of RTD, but yet, you know, there aren't resources that are commensurate with that. Um, all of which is to say, I guess, can we, is there precedent for um, CDOT for, to provide additional funding through whatever their, um, their resources are? Is there precedent at all for the, the legislature to provide that funding. I mean, I, I know how hard that is. I served in the legislature and I served on the Joint Budget Committee and, and having um, you know, a reliable, uh, steady source of, of revenue is really, really important. And, and it's pretty hard to get that out of the legislature. But I, I guess I just wonder, where is the conversation happening about really how to bridge this huge, huge gap in, um, in, in your funding needs? Well, do you want to address that? I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start and I can okay. defer to others. Certainly on this call might be better at, at you know, addressing this than me. I, I think, you know, what we have been so focused on with the system optimization plan is focused on that shorter term piece. You know, the longer term piece is a challenge too. And I, and I think that, you know, there have been certainly conversations regionally about, you know, additional resources. Um, and, and there is, you know, precedent, you know, we, we do get some funding from the state. Um, certainly, we'd love to get more. <laughs> um, it, it'd be a great opportunity, you know, and I, I think, I think everybody would agree on this call that regionally, there needs to be more funding for transportation in general, and looking at that as a broader context, I think is important. I think what, what we'll see come out of this plan ultimately is that there are needs well beyond what we can provide. And, you know, we are certainly as an agency open to being a partner in any kind of discussions about regional funding, um, you know, whether it would be for transit, for transportation, you know, a combination thereof. I, I think it's just, you know, it's a, it's a national issue. I mean, it's a, it's, it is a definitely a regional issue that we need to have more conversation about. Thank you, Bill. Uh, do any other RTD uh, staff uh, want to address that? I see Chair Busek is up next. Why don't I call on uh, on uh, Chair Busek to uh, uh, to address that as well? Go ahead, Vince. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, my hand is up for another reason, but yeah, we continue sure. to work with our legislature uh, to to get as much funding uh, and funding opportunities as we possibly can. We're currently working with some with the legislature and funding some fare free days coming up later this summer. There'll be more word about that uh, coming in the near future. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, CEO Johnson, did you want to address this as well? Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. And just for uh, context, I was gonna say there is great opportunity as we look across the country quite naturally and we look at the state's investment and other uh, areas in, in reference to transportation, the state of Colorado is lagging. I mean, for all intents and purposes, for each resident that resides in other states per se, on average, they could be contributing at the state uh, level approximately $20 to $25 per resident. And here, I believe it's just over a dollar. 
And so when we look at it holistically, there has been precedence that has been set across the country as a whole. And we are now faced with playing catch up collectively. And I do recognize that we have a challenging environment in reference to having a service area that's 2,342 square miles. Um, and then with the residual impacts caused by the pandemic, holistically, what we're trying to do is balance that. So I provide that just for context in the sense that there is an opportunity. And as Chair Busick uh, stated, we are working in earnest with a myriad of different stakeholders and the state legislature as we're trying to entice people to get out of their cars and change their commuting habits for the better in reference to reducing vehicle miles traveled. So we look forward to um, legislation that the legislature will bring forward and RTD uh, collectively wants to be a solution in that, but needs but need the help of all jurisdictions as we deal with other issues that plague society as a whole, because the operative word and what we do here at RTD is public and we don't pick and choose who can utilize the system. We're supposed to be here to connect those communities. So uh, with that, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Shaw, I wonder, I saw that uh, Commissioner Stanton has raised his hand and I wanna ask him, is that to uh, respond on this particular question? And we could go to you first. Uh, no, I had a, a different comment, if I may. Um, I want to talk about muscle memory. And uh, here in northern Jefferson County, a lot of people who commute, for example, on FF7 and other buses, which the service has been discontinued, have changed their pattern of commuting. I think it's absolutely essential what you all are doing. And Bill Sarai, I really appreciated the brief. But Everything hangs uh, on the state effort for greenhouse gas reduction, on increasing transit and buses. And I think um, it's gonna be a lot harder than it may seem. And a lot of the projections for 2025 and 2030, I think may be optimistic unless the service improves. So you have a, a chicken and egg problem. And I wish that, and I've talked to Shelly Cook, our representative about this extensively, I appreciate what's going on, but I don't think it's gonna come back like you think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Busick, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I, and I wanted to direct my comments to the Dr. Cog uh, letter dated March 9, 2022. I wanna thank you and your board of directors for this letter. I, I tend to agree with everything you said. I also wanna thank the 58 communities represented by Dr. Cog and the 3.3 million people that are also represented uh, through this letter. Uh, some of the takeaways that I read in this letter were really apropos, uh, particularly that equity populations and low-income households exist outside the urban core, something we need to recognize. Also, employment opportunities exist throughout the region, not just in the urban core. And using only a ridership lens to produce the SOP is really not an appropriate measure. I also agree that we need to adjust the SOP to enhance coverage, uh, to address all of these issues. And also adjusting the SOP to increase coverage will also help us reduce congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, short, to sum that up, obviously, I, I thank you for this letter. I agree with the things you say. The SOP is still a work in progress, and I hope that through this process, we'll be able to address those issues. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We especially like uh, comments like we agree with everything you say. Uh, you might uh, want to well, almost it. one. Uh, almost everything you say, yeah, almost. I was going to say, you might want to pass that on to my colleagues on the Denver City Council. I could use the, I could use the back end. <laughs> uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Thank you so much. I, um, I, I know that this is a long-term look, and I, I um, look at you know, your workforce um, challenges as well as um, a tendency for some of the businesses around to um, uh, look to the future with more work from home type days. But um, when I look at four to five dollar a gallon gasoline, I think we have in front of us quite an opportunity to educate the public 
um, to try and rebuild ridership on those backbone lines. Um, I think at one point there was an application, either, um, either a phone app or on the web to say, I'm here and I want to go here, give me directions, you know, get on the zero zero bus and jump on the light rail D line and so on and so forth. Um, and if we can somehow figure out a way, even through, you know, maybe public service announcements or whatever, to educate the public on how to use the services that do exist, you know, the, the safety from bodily harm, the safety by using masks um, that still exists on transit, um, we might be able to help build back uh, a core ridership for RTD and with that, you know, ultimately build back what we saw um, at the height of usage prior to COVID. So just some comments there, but um, we, we do need RTD. We do need you to succeed. And um, I'm not against taking a short-term opportunity to, for the long-term gain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Mr. Papsdorf, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, tag on to Director um, Shaw's comments because uh, Dr. Cog's Way to Go program is actually working on some some media strategies and messaging strategies through our mm -hmm. through the Way to Go program to promote transit as an alternative, uh, as a viable alternative, given the um, high gas prices people are experiencing now. And so we want to we do want to take advantage of sort of this this current uh, time and inform people and make sure we're educating people as much as we can about uh, transit as a, as a good alternative to avoid um, those high gas prices and try to try to do our small little part to rebuild ridership and get people back on buses and trains. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Director Williams, go ahead. Yeah, um, in response to the comments, I, I'd like to know for everybody that Dr. Cog just approved some funding that is designed to help with travel training. There is a travel training program in the area to teach people how to use public transit. Um, the primary problem with new people is that they're afraid. It's something that they don't know how to do. They haven't they don't know where to start to even learn how to do it. So um, I'd like to commend Dr. Cog for approving that funding to help teach people how to ride public transit and uh, to let you all know that that is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I do want to uh, point out, uh, as you did, Bill, just to reemphasize the challenging geography of the RTD district, as you mentioned, it's almost 2,400 square miles. And when I was the uh, uh, communications project manager for the Eagle project, the, uh, the commuter rail system, uh, I used to point out in community presentations that the RTD district, uh, the extent of it is actually larger than the state of Rhode Island. Uh, but then I would always point out that what, what isn't larger than Rhode Island? <laughs> but seriously, that's a it's a huge challenge because it's not just different in topography and geography, but uh, but in demographics, uh, and in need, and in our ability to reach them. So, with that in mind, Bill, one of the things uh, that I've that's occurred to me during the reimagined sessions uh, that I've attended is uh, when we turn one dial up, sometimes it affects another dial. So, uh, people uh, want reliability and they want frequency. And to help accomplish that, you've proposed uh, eliminating longer routes in order to increase the reliability and on-time performance. But we also know that every time we introduce a transfer into someone's travel, that has a, a tendency to diminish some marginal ridership around the edges. Uh, the more I have to uh, have a two-seat ride or even a three-seat ride rather than one seat, uh, that might affect my decision whether to leave my car in the garage or not. Uh, how how does the SOP uh, account for this uh, this particular dial uh, of the impact on ridership? 
of transfers. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a challenge um, because we, we, I think a lot of folks have gotten used to one seat rides and I can use light rail as an example, Kevin, you know this very well, um, that, you know, we've had the C and the D and the E and the F. Obviously, you know, you know, a year and a half ago, we eliminated the C and the F from our route pattern. And that was, you know, there was some challenges with it because it was dealing with a lot of congestion, you know, in the, in the area between I-25 and Broadway and, and um, right. Central Platte Valley Junction um, by Auraria that, that we would get constantly get congestion. It would decrease reliability, but it does add a transfer because now we, you know, have, you know, we've gone from four route patterns to two. And um, what we are trying to do, and we're doing this on our bus system as well, is trying to make those connections where you meet those as painless as possible. And so mm -hmm. that connection, you know, between the D and the E or the E and the D, um, hopefully, you know, I know that I take the D regularly and, you know, the train waits. The train waits for that yes. train to come from Central Platte Valley and holds until they get there. So the, the notion is that people can get used to it, but I do think, you know, transfers are going to be built into the system. The, the one seat rides are going to be a real challenge this from all parts of the district. There still will be one seat rides, but it is something that as an agency, I think that we have to look at just because of where we're at and the efficiency that we have to build into our system. So, I mean, it, it is kind of be, a, it's, yeah. Okay. No, thank, thank you very much. Uh, any other comments on this item from members? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this discussion. I appreciate it very much. Uh, the next item is administrative. Uh, item seven, member comment or other matters. Do uh, members have any comment or other matter? <laughs> Seeing none, our next meeting oh. will, oh, uh, Mr. Papsdorf, go ahead. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I was slow getting to my unmute and camera button. Um, I, just, I, I did want to inform, take a moment to inform the committee that um, Dr. Cog is planning on a uh, return to the office beginning um, April 1st. Um, our intent at this point uh, for um, our technical, our transportation advisory committee, your technical staff, is to have uh, start in-person meetings again at their end of April meeting and potentially the May RTC meeting being an in-person meeting, um, not April, but, but May. And so stay tuned for that. We'll We'll continue to evaluate that situation, but I wanted to at least get that on people's radar screens and anticipate the possibility of a May meeting of the RTC occurring in person at the Dr. Cog offices. Thank you. Uh, uh, Executive Director Rex, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to follow up on Ron's comments. Ron is correct. We are planning on transitioning back to the office and in-person meetings. I think uh, there's many of us that are excited about the, the opportunities that that brings. Um, I will tell you that at least at the executive committee level, we have had uh, some conversations about the RTC and what the status of our meetings might be with regards to whether we will continue to host them in a hybrid setting. Um, I know it's difficult for some folks to get downtown on an early morning um, on, on Tuesdays, uh, especially you know if you don't work downtown. So uh, we, what we may do is maybe we'll have an agenda item at the next meeting to have a conversation about that and, and just get your input on how you would like to proceed as a group. Um, so there's also a possibility, I'll throw it out there, that we can meet at a different time, right? There's no reason we have to meet at 8.30 in the morning. Um, so, so anyway, maybe we'll, we'll add an uh, item for discussion and, and uh, just get everybody's take. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And we do need to have that discussion. I, uh, at the risk of uh, uh, seeing what the outcome is and predetermining it, I wonder if people could raise their hand if you are in the meeting here. Uh, and could you have made this meeting today were it to have been downtown? Raise your hand. Okay, interesting. I don't know about the people who's, who aren't on video, so you could electronically raise your hand. Interesting. All right, a very mixed result. Uh, thank you. I, are there any other matters by members? All right, next meeting is April 19th, which is Patriots Day. 
And uh, with that, uh, all our business is concluded and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks again for Thanks. everyone's patience. Thanks.